I'm Crystal Dilworth, Polycrystal HD, here for Raw Science. On the eve of my PhD thesis defense, here to talk about technologies that are going to change the way that we experience our world. I have two illustrious guests here with me. One is Philip Lowe, who's the inventor of the iBrain and founder and CEO of the company NeuroVigil. Our other guest is Elon Musk, who really needs no introduction, but he's also at the helm of the private space company, SpaceX. So thank you so much for joining me, guys. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So Philip, I want to know a little bit about this iBrain, and I understand that there's a new version. Yeah, so, well, the iBrain is the world's first um, uh, mobile brain monitor, uh, in the sense that it's, uh, we've introduced it as a little startup um, four years ago. The company Hoffman La Roche has used it to do outpatient clinical trials. Since then, we've used it with uh, a number of other pharmaceutical companies. And what we've done is we've collected data from individuals who are sleeping. We've produced maps of brain activity to see how they react to pathologies and to uh, particular compounds. Um, the devices have become smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and this latest version is uh, about the size of a uh, miniature Listerine uh, packet. So it's really tiny. So that's, that's the Listerine. Mm -hmm. And, oh. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is iBrain 3. Uh, the first one, though, did fit in Tic Tac boxes. So we've gone from, you know, uh, from one level of dental hygiene to another. But um, this is pretty exciting to us because it means that it is now possible to record for neural data, not only from a few hundred people, a few thousand people, but literally tens of thousands of hundred or hundreds of thousands of people. And with that, we want to use the power of analytics and big data in order to really see if people are actually diseased before they have symptoms. So you're looking for a pattern in the brain waves? We're looking for patterns, and we're, we're, we're also making sure that new drugs, before they hit the market, are actually clean and safe. So Elon, you've been very vocal about the possibilities of colonizing other planets, specifically Mars, and right. your own company is doing a lot of work to get us to the stage where we're able to do that. Do you think that starting a colony on Mars would kind of be a chance to start over and maybe do a little bit better? Or do you think it's a chance to copy what nature on Earth has already created for us? Yeah, I think it's quite likely that we'd want to bioengineer new organisms that are better suited to living on Mars. Um, I mean, humanity's kind of done that over time uh, by sort of selective breeding. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, cows didn't evolve in the wild. Right. Um, but that's a very slow process, requires, you know, hundreds of generations. Uh, whereas I think with actual bioengineering, you could make that happen a lot faster, maybe with more precision. Ideally, long term, um, although this is a tricky subject, you'd want to write genetics. What do you mean by that? Meaning you want to you'd want to create synthetic organisms, completely synthetic organisms. Not necessarily completely, but uh, you know, start with some base and then modify stuff. In the interest of colonization of other planets, um, are you relying on the research of government-funded space programs on the effects of you know being in space for long periods of time, or does SpaceX have any interest in doing its own research? Well, I, I think the the verdict is in with respect to long-term. Uh, existence in, in space, R really mostly well, about so zero G. Your, your, your in my opinion, it is defining certainly. Defining long term, too. Uh, well, certainly um, more than enough to get to Mars. Okay. You know, Mars is, if you, if you have a low energy trajectory, like minimum energy trajectory, it's about six months. Um, and I think that can be compressed down to about three months. Um, and it gets exponentially harder as you go lower than that. Three, three to four. Um, I mean, and it's important to actually be at that level because then you can. Uh, send your spaceship to Mars and bring it back on the same uh, orbital synchronization. So um, Earth and Mars sync up every two years, um, and then they're only kind of in, in sync for about six months. So, you, you know, and, and then, you know, they're, they're really too far apart. So you've, you've got to be able to go there and back in one go, um, and, uh, and that, that's important for making the cost of traveling to Mars an affordable amount. Cause it, you think of like what's the key thing to establish a colony on Mars? It's it's the, it's the cost per per unit mass to the surface of Mars, um, or the cost per person um, as well. At a certain a level, if it's too high, obviously there'll no there won't be such a thing. But if once it gets to a certain level, it will ha the 
it's like a reaction. You know, the activation energy is sort of like the economic activation energy of a Martian colony. Um, and uh, I mean, right now it's like, a tr I don't know. If, the, the last NASA estimate was, was $500 billion, and that was during Bush the first. So, so I would imagine uh, today's estimate is a trillion. Um, now, we're not going to go spend a trillion dollars on sending like four people to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, so right, right now, the cost of going to Mars is beyond, beyond what can be afforded. So there's like, that's why there's like no, no one's going to Mars. Um, uh, but ultimately, in order to establish a colony, I think you've got to get the cost down to maybe half a million or less per person to go. And th there's got to be an intersection of sets of people that can afford to go and people that want to go. What was the moment that you decided that this was your mission, and how did you make that decision to investigate? So, Philip, I'm going to start with you. Sure. So, well, the thing is, I'm an accidental entrepreneur, and before that, I was an accidental neuroscientist, and before that, I was a mathematician. And then it wasn't until Stephen Hawking asked me to help him with his ALS that I became really involved in uh, trying to access consciousness uh, in humans. I think the, the previous work that I had done uh, on consciousness in animals was more to sort of show some of the, the basic similarities in terms of, of the neurobiology. But you know, it's, it's very interesting how these things work. I think when you're passionate, you really don't know why you do things. Because if you did, you may actually have some sort of control over them. Um, you know, in my case, when I was, when I was 10 years old, um, uh, my father was incarcerated. He had uh, threatened someone with a gun. Um, in Switzerland, it's a very bad idea to threaten a banker with a gun. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he had a, a drug in his system, a sleep uh, drug, which um, was found then later on to create quite a few side effects, inc including extreme violence. So he was, you know, he was sent to jail. I remember going to see him then. Um, and his case was reopened. He was the first person to be pardoned by the, by the cantonal parliament in Geneva unanimously. And at the time, I thought, you know, he, he got away with it. He had a very good attorney. And I was trying to, to be sort of clinical about the whole thing. Um, ironically, 15 years later, uh, I'm doing a PhD on, on sleep. I challenged uh, one of my, my professors. I said, you know, what if I, I uh, use this particular drug, for example, in mice? just to see his reaction. He said, Philip, you can't use this. It makes people psychotic and aggressive. So once I had heard this 15 years later, you know, I, I thought, OK, this is uh, perhaps, perhaps my father was not, as, you know, or, or was not guilty at all. So uh, it was interesting. My first reaction was to pick up the phone and uh, apologize 15 years later to my father that you know, I had doubted uh, his innocence. I thought you were just bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it was interesting. And now, of course, we're helping some pharmaceutical companies come up with cleaner drugs. You know, that's exactly what we do. So it's it, really a very personal motivation. I, I guess it, I guess I guess it, it is. But I didn't realize that it was until I actually had been I, I had begun doing it. Thank you for sharing that. So I guess I'll ask you the same question, Elon. Like, what what's what drives you? Like, when did you realize that? this work was important, and sort of what's your personal motivation behind it? Yeah, it was just when I was in college, I mean, I, I try to think, well, what are the things that are most going to affect the future of humanity? And I wanted to be involved in at least some of those things. I didn't expect to be involved in all of them. But it, mostly, I just wanted to be involved in things that I thought would matter to the future, and um, to be able to look back and say, OK, I did something useful there. That's did you have specific role models that were influential in the decisions that you made that you, uh, or was it just some type of, you know, an internal understanding that this is what you needed to do? Well, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say there was like one, it wasn't any one particular role model. I mean, there's certainly many people that I admire in history. Um, you know, Tes Tesla. Te Tesla obviously <laughs> being one of them. Yes. Um, I, I think it stems because I had this like existential crisis when I was a kid and, uh, and tried to figure out what's it all about and, conf and none of the books I read seemed to actually have a good answer. You know, so I said I read all the religious texts and I read a bunch of philosophy books, and they're all quite depressing, um, <laughs> particularly the Germans. <laughs> um, actually, when I read uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I thought, okay, this is a pretty good one. Um, you know, just to sort of try to uh, gain greater enlightenment over time. That seems like a good goal because we don't really know what the meaning of the, of, the, of life is. Um, but, or even really what the right questions are to ask, but if we can uh, improve our understanding of the universe, then eventually we can figure out what the right question to ask is, uh, you know, 
it's not meaning of life, it's something, you know. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you, Elon and Philip, for joining me here and sharing your thoughts about consciousness and enlightenment and technology and where we're going. I really appreciated it. So thank you so much. And hopefully we'll have a lot of other very interesting conversations about technology and the future of humanity.